Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, buenas tardes. Thanks to everyone for, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, welcome to the dialogue. Um, I think for two reasons, it's a great moment to talk about Latin America's economic challenges. Uh, the first is the tough situation that the, much of the region is facing, uh, which is experiencing considerable stagnation. Of the five largest economies in the region, only Colombia has been growing at 2% a year or more in the last five years. We have new governments in Brazil. Also, Bolsonaro has been there about seven months. Uh, Mexico, Lopez Obrador was elected but over the, a year ago in, in July. Uh, August 7th will be the end of the first year of the Duque administration uh, in Colombia. There are important elections coming up in Argentina uh, in October, as well as Uruguay and Bolivia. And of course, uh, Venezuela's economy continues in free fall. The global economy is also uncertain. China's rapid growth is slowing. There are many challenges confronting the EU, and U.S. policies are unpredictable. It's unclear what the Fed will do, and of course we have elections here next year. Technologies are, rap are changing rapidly with profound implications for competitiveness and economic growth. Of course, there have been advances over the last decades. Inflation is under control in most countries, and there are also independent central banks. Well, what else can and should the region be doing to manage their domestic economic policies more effectively? The second reason why this is a great moment to have this session to talk about Latin America's economic challenges is that we have the very good fortune of having the two best economic analysts we were able to draft and who have agreed to share their insights and expertise with us. Joyce Chang is the global head of research at JP Morgan. She's been there, had that position since 2014. Uh, the institutional investor named the, the global research team uh, the top in the country in 2017, 2018. For the past five years, American Banker has named her one of the top 25 most powerful women in finance. She serves on the board of directors of Trickle, Trickle Up and Girls Incorporated and has devoted considerable effort in her career, encouraging women to pursue careers in finance. She's also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and even more important than that, a member of the Inter-American Dialogue. And uh, we're very, very happy to have her with us uh, today. Uh, Santiago Levy is a non-resident fellow uh, at the Brookings Institution, working with the Economic and Social Policy in Latin, Amer in Latin America Initiative. For 10 years, he was Vice President for Sectors and Research at the Inter-American Development Bank. He's held many top positions in universities as well as government, including being the General Director of the Mexican Social Security Institute, and before that, the Deputy Minister of Finance and Public Credit in Mexico. He was the main architect of the Progresa Oportunidades program, Mexico's incentive-based health, nutrition, and education program for the poor. He's a very good friend of the Inter-American Dialogue, a good personal friend, and he's also a regular participant in our Latin American Economic Roundtable that's run by Nora Lustig, who is with us today, who's also a Dialogue member. Thanks for being here. And also Peter Hakem, uh, who is the President uh, Emeritus uh, of the Dialogue. Um, before turning it over to Joyce and Santiago, I want to thank Peter. Uh, who really organized, uh, is the one responsible for organizing and coordinating this session. Uh, we can always count on him to cheer us up in, ca in case we get too optimistic at any point. Uh, and I'm sure he has already has a few tough questions ready uh, that he's going to ask. And I also want to thank the Dialogue staff, Irene and Elizabeth, for their help in making this event possible. So we look forward to an interesting and informative discussion and with that, Joyce, you have the floor. Oh, well, well, thank you so much, Michael. It's such a pleasure to be here with Santiago, who I've just had the greatest admiration and respect for, and so many people I've learned from um, for so many decades, from Nora and many of you. And, and Peter had first gotten me involved um, in the dialogue in the 1990s. 
And I didn't know that much about Latin America, so I've learned so much from so many of the members here and so many of the government officials and, and, and think tanks who come through here. So I do have a PowerPoint presentation because you know, I'm from Wall Street, and that's what we do. <laughs> um, but I thought I would start by trying to answer a few questions. Um, you know, why has growth slowed down so much? Um, how much of this is due to external factors? How much of it is due to um, you know, domestic factors? And also bring in the discussion on China's outlook and how that affects Latin America. Because I think um, you know, the fate of emerging markets more broadly is very much tied to China's outlook. So where are we right now? And you're, it, it, you know, the comment that you needed Peter to uh, sort of you know, bring more pessimism into the discussion, there's not a lot of optimism here. And I'm going to make sure that you can uh, get an email copy of this. Um, it's been cleared for me to email out. So this is actually the sixth um, straight year that Latin America is growing below potential. So first of all, where do we have potential growth in Latin America? I mean, we have it at you know sub 2% to start with. The China story is big, because a lot of people ask me, um, you know, why hasn't Mexico been able to take off? And I do tie that back to um, China's entry into the WTO in 2001. But that was a period then where just the cheaper labor, the maquiladoras, and a lot of the direction of trade went more towards China. And if you take a look at now the exports that go to China versus the United States, Brazil is a very good example of how exports turned to China. Um, you know, that it was that, that now you have doubled the amount of exports going to China as to the United States, where that destination really changed. But if you take a look at potential growth um, and structural reform, we see a, a, a downward trend still to potential growth um, in Latin America. And you know, Santiago is going to talk about these reports, uh, these, 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 his, how he looks at the numbers as well. But some of this is structural obstacles, that the productivity growth has lagged um, behind other regions. And the blue line at the bottom is Latin America. You can see. Um, that the Asia Pacific line is the top line. And you can see that North America is the orange line. But part of this has been the productivity growth. Part of it has been structural reforms. Part of it has been um, the ability to attract um, investment flows. Um, now, we do think we are still, hope springs optimistic. I mean, we still think that Latin America will bounce back after this. But in 2018, our forecast was that you had you know, recessions um, you know, in Latin America that you would bounce back from this year. But then you had Argentina, then you had Mexico and Brazil, the, the downtakes in growth. Um, we do think that you could have growth um, you know, come back to um, around 2% next year. But these four recovery forecasts have been um, thwarted before. And this just gives you a breakdown of our forecast for next year. We're at 2.1% growth um, next year, with Mexico at 1.7% and um, with Brazil at 2%. Those are the two biggest weights in the economy. Argentina coming out of recession at 2.5%. And um, you know, we have not included any numbers actually for Venezuela because we don't, we don't feel that we can credibly actually you know, necessarily dictate and, and forecast those numbers. But it, so can Latin America recover to its low potential um, and, um, you know, as we go ahead into next year? Now, I wanted to just share a chart about the politics because the election cycle are over outside of Argentina, but the political capital still matters um, to set and execute the agenda. But you can see Brazil, Bolsonaro, it's gone up. But let's take a look at the other countries, including Mexico. So Mexico, you can see this peak with AMLO and this very sharp drop um, down in the opinion on the country's outlook in Mexico. Um, you can also see that even in some of the countries where you know, they are the more stable countries in the region, in Chile, the approval versus the disapproval ratings. Um, and, um, and you can also see, if you take a look at Argentina, just uh, what has happened with um, Macri, too, over, over the last um, two or three years. But you know, at the heart of it, why has Latin America slowed down? So some of this is structural. Um, some of it is the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Some of it is the linkages to China and the trade uncertainty. Some of it, but at the heart of it, you still have um, a dependency on the commodity cycle. Um, and commodity prices remain the dominant transmission channel of shocks, which is why we think if you do believe that China will slow down and that base metals could go through another super cycle, um, this will hurt Latin America disproportionately. 
But what you can see is that um, commodities remain the same dominant transition channel for the shocks. Um, and that's kind of an age-old story in Latin America. Um, on um, the um, uh, um, you know, current accounts, on the external accounts, um, you've had um, a current account deficit that's very manageable. Actually, on the current account balances, you can see where we were at the time of the global financial crisis in 2008 and how much adjustment has occurred. So it's not the external accounts this time in Latin America. The exchange rates have also gone through a big adjustment um, after 2015, and less so um, you know, in, the, in the past year. But you still have, is inflation a problem in Latin America, that if you had significant depreciation of the currency, you have a risk to inflation. That's not what we're forecasting, that you have a significant depreciation of the currencies at this point in time. But um, you, know, you still have that inflation risk in Latin America. Um, you know, you also have China risk. So if China, um, if, if, if China were to weaken its currency, um, you look at the correlation that you have with Brazil, even with the Mexican peso, the vulnerabilities. So there's, you know, what is facing Latin America you know, on its own internal you know, productivity, education, the need for investments, but also these external shocks. Now, the foreign direct investment flows do exceed the current account deficits, but there are, um, you know, variations um, you know, within, um, within, within the countries. And I think that um, you know, that's been a relatively stable number. So this time, I don't see it as being the external accounts that actually take Latin America you know, off the rails. I see it as much more of a problem of um, confidence, the external environment, and also the productivity gains rather than any type of external balance of payments crisis. And you can also see that the debt has been stabilizing in some countries, but Brazil is the outlier. Um, and that is the blue bar um, going up. It's, it's more challenged. Um, in Argentina, we're assuming program compliance, which means it is a pretty sharp downturn. They stay in the program, and um, that continuity remains in place. So overall, you know, the, the glass half full story is, are we at the bottom? Are we at the bottom, and is there a comeback to 2% growth that we had sort of a double whammy? We had recessions in um, 2018 that we thought we would come out of this year, but yet and you had even more risk. I think a lot of this brought on by the trade uncertainty in US-China and an investment environment that was not conducive, and some of it brought on by the Argentina shock. You've had the Venezuela shock as well. Are we at the bottom right now, and we're actually be able to stabilize at something closer to potential growth? Thank you very much, Joyce. Uh, Santiago, um, more, optimist, more optimistic. Thing. So how do we get his slide up? He has one. So, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Does this work? Yes. Yeah. Yes. There. Thank you. I saw it. It flashed. <laughs> yeah, there it is. So, so thank you f um, to Peter, and thank you to Michael for, for inviting me. And it's always a pleasure to be together with pleasure. Joyce. <laughs> yeah. uh, <clears throat> so Peter sent me an email and said that Joyce was coming. And I said, sure, because I, I participate, because I always learn a lot from, from what Joyce does. And then this morning, I said, oh my god, you know, I, I've got to put something together. And so mm -hmm. I put together one slide. But, it's very, it, but it summarizes everything I talked about so, as so, well, because so we're very much. I just have one slide. And I want to walk you five minutes through what this slide means. And then I want to discuss a little bit why. So this is an accounting definition. There, there's no, absolutely no behavior. Strictly as an accounting, per capita GDP growth of any country in the world is whatever the growth of the capital stock from investment, plus the growth of the labor force, including schooling, and productivity. And productivity is just how good are we at doing things? And this will be true in China, in the United States, in Canada, in Chile. So that's just an accounting convention. And these numbers summarized over a very long period, more than half a century, comparing three regions of the world, the advanced economies, emerging Asia, and Latin America. And what the numbers tell is what I call in the slide Latin American strategy. 
Because what you can see from the numbers is that clearly Latin America has lost relevance vis-a-vis -vis East Asia, but also vis-a-vis -vis the advanced countries. What you should have expected is that for Latin America to close the gap in income per capita, and for Latin America to close the gap in income per capita vis-a-vis -vis the advanced countries, income per capita should have grown faster in Latin America than in the advanced economies. But the region as a whole grew 1.8. The advanced economies grew 2.5. So actually, the difference in the standard of living today between the average Latin American and the average person in the OECD countries is bigger than it was half a century ago. In East Asia, the opposite occurred. Income per capita grew much faster than in the advanced economy, so the average person in Thailand or the average person in Vietnam or in Hong Kong or in Singapore today has a standard of living that is much closer to the advanced countries and clearly much better on relative terms than Latin America. So that's the tragedy. If you think about the explanation for the tragedy, <coughs> it is not really because we have not invested as much as other countries. Yes, these stations invest a lot, but we've actually invested more than the advanced countries. And it is also not because our labor force is not growing as fast and is educating as fast as they are. It's so natural that the labor force in the advanced countries, because they're more mature, the demographic transition is more advanced, will grow slightly more slowly. But the difference between lack and emerging Asia is not that much. The real difference over the last half century, what really matters in terms of the standards of living of these three regions of the world. And in a way, what summarizes the tragedy of our region is the zero in productivity. This is a region of the world that today is no more better at putting capital and labor together and producing goods than it was a century, half a century ago. If you think about that, it's mind-blowing. It's sort of mind-blowing, and you say, that cannot be true. It cannot be true that a half century later, Latinos are not more efficient than they were half a century ago. So that number zero there is capturing two things. It's capturing the fact that the region has had a whole bunch of macro crises, and when there's a macro crisis, measure productivity goes down. The labor force of the country is still the same. The capital stock of the country is still the same. Factories are not working as much. Workers are somewhat unemployed or not working as much. So measure productivity goes down. So part of the explanation for that zero is the various sequential macroeconomic crises that Latin America has had in the 60s, the 70s, of course, the last decade of the 80s. But it is not the whole story. We always discuss, when we think about Latin America, external conditions. And Joyce was rightly pointing out to external conditions. But emerging Asia and Latin America are part of the same world. We all live the Fed up and down. We all live oil up and down. We all live copper up and down. So external conditions from East Asia over the half century are not that different from external conditions for Latin America over the half century. We're not in the moon. We're in the same planet. So the same external conditions. And we've also managed to learn and manage our macroeconomy much better, particularly over the last three decades. If you think about Chile, they've had a sustained macro stabilization for quite some time. Perhaps the best story in the macro in Latin America. But it's also true about Peru after the big hyperinflation. It's also true about Mexico after the tequila crisis. 
and it's also true in some way about Colombia. Other countries, the large ones, are not as well managed. Perhaps Brazil would come then. Then Argentina and Venezuela is a class of its own. But it's all not macro crisis. Yeah. East Asia also had their macro crisis. Korean crisis, Indonesia had. So part of the story is macro crisis, but it's not the whole story. And over the last three decades, it's not really the central part of the story. The central part of the story is the fact that for reasons that we don't fully understand, or at least I don't fully understand, these economies are not able to increase productivity over time. They've educated their labor force. They invest in the same equipment and factories as the East stations, but their economies lack the dynamism and the ability to get them. And for lack of a better name, I call that dysfunctional social arrangements. What do I mean by dysfunctional social arrangements? <coughs> Probably the most important social institution in Latin America is the family. And the family is actually a source of strength in Latin America. That social institution is also extremely strong in East Asia. But perhaps the second most important social institution of any country is the labor market. Think about it. That's where every day, everybody from 18 years old through 65, 68, every day interacts with somebody else. They can be bosses, they can be workers, they can be self-employed, but it's the most important, second most important social institution. And if you were to use a word to describe the labor markets of Latin America, it would be dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. Because it doesn't matter that these countries invest, and it doesn't matter that these countries educate their labor force, it's still true that on the demand side of the labor market, firms are very, very small. Very few firms have more than 50 workers. A lot of people work on their own. And most people in the region work informally. And this has been true despite large advances in education and investments. Look at the numbers there. These informal sectors that we tend to think are going to sort of fade away by magic are the antithesis of productivity. Firms have three to four workers. Workers spend three years, two years, they migrate to another firm, they work on their own. No economies of scale, no economies of scope, no learning by doing, no investment in labor training, very little technology adoption. So this doesn't matter from 2019 to 2020, and it doesn't matter from 2020 to 2021. But from 1960 to 2020, it really matters. It's the whole difference. It's the whole game. We waste our capital and we waste our labor because a dysfunctional social arrangement called the labor market doesn't work. It's not the only dysfunctional social arrangement of Latin America. We also have extremely concentrated income distribution that generates a lot of rent-seeking activity at the very top of the distribution. And a lot of firms that exercise monopoly power and succeed in the market, not so much because they are innovating East Asian style or European style or American style, but they're succeeding because they're exercising monopoly power because they happen to be the cousin of the president, the friend of the finance minister, or they just bribed the competition commission, or they got a concession for 50 years, or whatnot, and their rents. <coughs> and if the rents to be had, why bother with innovation? Why bother with technical change? The combination of rent seeking at the top <coughs> and dysfunctional social arrangements reflected in informality is lethal. Because then it says that people scramble, people collect rents, <coughs> 
And then the next year, exactly the same. And the next year, the same after that. I always think of the persons who sell corn in Mexico in the streets. I don't know if you watch the production function of people selling corn in the streets. There's a little cart in which there's investment. He invested in that little cart. He boils corn in a big thing with hot water. He pulls out a corn, puts a wooden stick, and then puts butter and sells it. And next year, that person will do the same. Technical change, zero. And the year after that, he will do the same. Technical change, zero. Productivity growth, zero. This is an extreme example. But the data shows, this is research at the IDB, but there's a lot of whole research about this, that firms in Latin America don't grow. Firms in Latin America are very small. They die, and then another firm that is equally small and equally unproductive replaces the firm that already died. Schumpeter never set a foot in Latin America. What we think as markets generating destructive creation, a process in which technical change and innovation and learning by doing is going to take place, is not going to happen. So this is a region of the world in which the returns to education are falling, because even though we're producing a lot of engineers and a lot of um, doctors and a lot of computer programmers, the demand for them is not that big. Because all these you know, little stands don't need computer programmers and they don't need lawyers and they don't need people like that. So in terms of Michael's questions at the beginning of the talk, it's the politics, stupid. It really is the politics. It is the politics of societies that have been able to turn democratic, and this is a big gain, that have been able to, by and large, improve their macro management. Venezuela aside, Argentina is always a special case, but by and large, have improved their macro management, but have not been able over the last three decades to change their dysfunctional social arrangements, either in terms of changing the nature of rent-seeking behavior by many people, or the nature of the labor market. Worse. This is a region of the world in which, as opposed to East Asia, there's a huge amount of redistribution that is being done by the state for reasons that we all understand and sympathize with. But it's a whole bunch of redistribution that is being done through the labor market, making the labor market even more dysfunctional. So I know this is controversial, but this is my view. I am perfectly happy, and I think that in the United States, it is good to raise the minimum wage as a way to redistribute. But I actually think that in Mexico, in which workers around one or two minimum wage are 80% informal, it's particularly dysfunctional to try to improve the distribution of income by raising the minimum wage when 80% of the workers are in the informal sector. But then we do this continuously and continuously. And when that doesn't work, we then do microcredits. And we then subsidize more of these small little firms. And when that doesn't work, we then give special tax regimes for these little firms. And we try to redistribute again and again. So that zero summarizes a huge complexity of rent-seeking behavior at the top, dysfunctional social labor markets, and a very ingrained ideology in the region imported from Europe in the 19th century about the role of the state and about the way the state redistributes and the way it has to do its function. Latin Americans work very hard. They study hard. They're as innovative as everybody else. They are as risk-taking as anybody else. It's just that the social context in which economic activity is being displayed is not as good. And yes, we have improved a lot the macro-management, and that's much better than before. But when Joyce puts numbers about potential growth for the region at 2.2, Joyce is already incorporating in her projections the dysfunctionality embedded in the workings of these economies because potential growth at 2.2 for countries in Latin America is actually very low. Should be four. If we just get two points of productivity growth on top of the numbers that we have. If you had added two points of productivity growth to that number over the last half century, this would be a completely different region. And as in Macondo, you know, as in Garcia Marquez Macondo, this repeats and repeats. 
and there we stand. Thank you. Thanks, Santiago. Oh. Uh, <laughs> we didn't need you, Peter's pessimism. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to cheer us up. You're going to have to play a different role in this. But um, let me let me start by thank you for two excellent uh, presentations. Uh, it's a bit sobering, uh, but uh, let me let me start by asking. Um, let's start with Santiago and then ask Joyce. Is, is there any, you know? Politics is not, you say it's politics stupid. Well, politics is not frozen. Um, politics is, it, it, has there been any case in the region, uh, despite the bleak picture overall, where you think there have been uh, signs or manifestations of somewhat uh, progress in those social arrangements that you can track and see if that really is, is really critical? And, 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 and making a change, or is everything just kind of... So, so Chile, Chile post Pinochet is probably an example of both a successful macroeconomic stabilization and a political understanding of some changes that needed to be done to get the economy in a much better shape. And, and I think there's a lot to be learned by the experience of Chile during those decades. And also, Nora was asking just before the, somewhat, and, and, and I don't have the answer to this, an understanding of why those political understandings and those political arrangements are not functioning as well today as they were. But yes, there are contexts in which societies are able to understand that the only way to progress is not only to stabilizing the macro, that the only way to really progress over the medium term is to increase productivity. That there's no substitute. And I think the Chileans did that. But that discourse is not in the political discourse of the region today, I think. Okay, thanks. Um, listen to your presentation. Uh, there, uh, you put a lot of emphasis on, on external factors, the global uh, economy and how it's affected. What, what, uh, we don't want to end up with a you know, sense that, the Latin, that Latin America is somehow you know, passive in this and just has to sort of, whatever the consequence of the global economy are, that's what they're coming to be. So what, what do you see in terms of, um, you know, steps that governments are taking that you see as, as positive and what worries you and what, in this context that affects all regions, uh, what do you think Latin American policymakers should well, I think from an investor point of view, everybody really looked at Brazil with the possibility, or is, is there really a, you know, an inflection point where you could have more positive change? You know, a sense that this is a country that went through a corruption scandal and um, you know, really did, you know, unlike some countries, you know, Im, you know, imprison people, you know, take some of the right steps, um, and have a very reform-oriented government coming into place, so tackling social security reform. Um, looking at privatization. So I think what investors are looking at is, as the largest economy, could you have that Brazil, you know, is where one should look for having, you know, a more hopeful scenario. Whereas I think for Mexico, the other second largest economy, we've done a lot of work on just um, just the, the effects of the trade uncertainty globally. Um, so this is more of a, a, a global argument. But, you know, um, we estimate that, you know, if you look at the growth dynamic from 1990 to 2010, it was really driven by global trade for emerging markets. And it kind of plateaued at 2010. But if you were to go back to, um, you know, um, you know the, the level of trade intensity plateaued at 2010, it hasn't necessarily come down dramatically, it's just stagnated. Mm -hmm. But if you were to have this trade war endure, um, and you went back to the year 2000 trade intensity level, we estimate that that would take productivity growth to zero. So I go back to Santiago's point on productivity. I mean, a lot of this is actually t tied to commodity cycle and global trade. And you know, how can Latin America stay competitive when you have the type of labor market segmentation and social structure that um, Santiago has talked about? Right. And I do think that a turning point for Latin America, and for, for at least for Mexico, was in 2001 when they entered the WTO because you know, the Mexico story had been 
you know, in the 1990s, um, you know, the wage differential, the maquiladoras, the manufacturing sector, and then the manufacturing sector story, um, and the labor costs sort of shifted to, um, to, to China. And I think, you know, when a lot of people say what, what happened in Mexico that really sort of changed the dynamic, I think China is a, you know, a good part of the answer, in addition to all of the sort of domestic um, entrenched problems as well, you have that um, particular shift going on. Then you have for a lot of the rest of the region that commodities have actually been a, a very big part of why um, th that's been the key transmission mechanism for a shock. But what can Latin America do? Um, so there's you know tackling some of the structural reforms. Um, there's you know the, the the privatization and the opening to foreign capital. Um, there's the um, and, and and there is also just a realization that look the, the potential growth has gone down. You know, around the world. So look, you take a look at um, Europe, and is there really a Japanization of Europe going on right now? Because look, potential growth in Europe is 1.1, 1.2. If you take half a percent off of European growth and you're at 0.5 percent, I mean, you're not going to get out of negative interest rates. I mean, it's just, you know, 46 percent of Europe has a negative interest rate right now. So you're in a much lower growth world, you know, to begin with, of which Latin America, I think because of the politics, has had these negative surprises. I mean, if I were sitting here um, you know, last year, I would have said, this is the year it'll go to 2%, which is exactly what I'm predicting for next year. <laughs> this must be the bottom. This must be the bottom, because they've already had the recession and the political crisis. So it couldn't be that there's three consecutive years of this after six straight consecutive years of below potential growth. There's certainly not going to be a third year like this. It will have bottomed, I hope, right? <laughs> I mean, I hope. And still, you're only looking at 2% growth. Uh, we haven't really talked about, neither of you really raised sort of this decade of 2003 and 2013 where there was high levels of growth in Latin America, what, 5% uh, uh, or something like that overall. Now, is it, was this, can you trace this, and also reduction in poverty and some countries' inequality, as Nora's documented, is this, was this totally uh, attributed to commodity prices or was it something else going on that was part of that story during that decade. Well, so uh, the other thing I had wanted to mention was that you, you had this real period where everybody thought Latin America will be investment grade. Right. Um, and then you had you know, just sort of the full fallen angel syndrome. So Brazil going to junk, a lot of people who had bought like Petrobras wants, the, the real question right now for Mexico is Mexico, not the country, but is Pemex going to go to junk is something the market is debating right now. And, and we think there's probably about a 70% probability that that will happen to Pemex. Right. And so you had just, how is the world looking at the investability of Latin America? So in 2012, after the financial crisis, you had a period where everybody said that actually Latin America has weathered this better than expected. And it's remained investment grade. Um, and then Fed taper tantrum happened, and then a lot of things got downgraded quite rapidly. So you remember people used to talk about the BRICS, but a lot of things got downgraded. Brazil, Russia, South Africa, Turkey. These were all investment grade. And that changed the whole emerging market story in many ways. So now it's a China is the emerging market story. It's not that it's this broad story anymore that we used to talk about the BRICS and how this will change. So Latin America is part of it. But part of it is if you're not investment grade, um, you're not going to get the kinds of flows that are just mainstream flows that go there as passive investment. And a lot of that is the politics. A lot of it is also the social structures that Santiago talked about. So I think what you had was this moment where if you look at this, I mean, Santiago, and I very much agree, it's, it's not a um, balance of payments crisis this time. It's not the old Latin America story. Um, it's, it's not that it's the current account deficit. It's the you know, exchange rate. Well, I mean, Argentina's had this. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not the usual old-fashioned Latin America crisis in most of the region, right. where it's about the external balance of payment shock. It's that you've had just you know subpar growth and just where the potential kept on coming down and down further. You don't have sort of the balance of payments crises that marked a lot of Latin America in the 80s and the 90s. Um, you know, but 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 you also haven't had any you know lift off. And so the brief lift off period was a sense that. Is Latin America sort of outperforming in a poor environment, and it's it's continuing to 
ascend in the ratings. But then you had that the politics really did derail a lot of that. Santiago? No, I mean, I, I agree with what Joyce said. And you, you can have periods in which good macro management without tackling these underlying social issues yields positive results. Mm -hmm. Because investors worldwide are looking at Latin America, are looking at Africa, are looking at East Asia. And if for some periods, Latin America has good macro management, independent central banks, developing institutions, it looks like a sort of good region. Um, you get slightly more investment flows, and you know, in the identity there, more investment will increase increase your growth. But that's kind of fickle. What we know about the the the, the beauty of looking at very long term series is that at the end of the day, there's no substitute for doing the domestic homework. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, we're going to open it up now for uh, questions. We're going to give priority to those who are optimistic in the, in the audience, because <laughs> otherwise we're going to all fall into a depression. Um, so if you could just please identify yourselves, and we'll start with Nora Lustig. Wait for the microphone, please, and tell us who you are and pose a question. I'm Nora. <laughs> Anyway, you know, I'm curious uh, what would happen in your graph if you added the other regions, because we could turn your story on its head and say that emerging Asia was the exception, that if you put Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia, they may not look that different from Latin America. It would be interesting to sort of complete that. Uh, and I would posit that you probably will find that, that emerging Asia was the exception. I mean, one has to remember that growth is a recent phenomenon, historically, and that in most uh, you know, economic theory, you would predict that growth will be relatively slow, right? It, I mean, the trend would be eventually that you're going to grow at uh, population growth. So uh, growth is new. It started in the 19th century, more or less, 18th century. And maybe Latin America had its moment before. Because if you look at data historically, Latin America was really catching up very quickly in the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. So with a longer perspective, the stories may get, and with more uh, regions, we, get, we may get uh, different types of stories, and we're in a bad moment right now. However, you know what makes it very curious about Latin America? So we talk about the China uh, effect, but you have countries that benefit from commodities going, commodity prices going up, and some that actually get hurt. So we should have a very heterogeneous story, which we don't see that much. You know? So it seems that uh, when the U.S. is growing, then Mexico should be growing very fast, and you know, El Salvador, etc. I think El Salvador did relatively better, but Mexico did not. And so the curiosity of uh, what's happening is that except for the boom years that uh, you alluded to, in the rest uh, it doesn't seem to be that uh, when a group is doing well, the other, word, the other group should then do well when, change, when the change occurs. So are the countries that were hurt by the commodity boom doing well now? Do they have better perspectives? Even if they're small, do we see a pattern that actually reflects this integration with China uh, well in terms of the linkages of the countries to the global economy. So Central America should be doing fine now, is it? Well, I, I think, I mean, Nora, I think you make a great point. There isn't necessarily, I mean, Argentina and, and Venezuela are in their own bucket, but there isn't sort of a big crisis um, you know, in Latin America right now. There's just very slow, below potential growth, and not an external crisis. And much of emerging markets does look like this. So if you look at emerging Europe, we have it at 1.3% growth. And you've certainly had disappointments in South Africa, Russia, and Turkey. And that you've had, and it's been based off of the politics, too. So that story is the same. But part of it is that you had sort of China exceptionalism. And the China exceptionalism is, you know, like first of all, China's growth numbers are overstated. Um, you know, China doesn't write down any bad investments. So the growth numbers are overstated there, right? I mean, um, and China growth is very different because growth there is not an output, it's an input. They decide what the growth target's going to be. And then, you know, they basically have the local governments meet that target. And there are basically 
the only way that a country can do that is there's two things they have to have. They have no hard budget constraint in China, and they have the capability to take on the debt. Now, they've had that capability to take on the debt, but now they're hitting this tipping point. And, and here's why I think the China 4.5% growth needs to be something that's incorporated, because it has real consequences for Latin America. So if you take a look at China, 